the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is being broadcast live at the RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Mass. Live broadcasts are available only in Reading due to technology constraints. This meeting was videotaped for distribution to the community TV stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. <coughs> uh, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, so Tom, you, you'll be the board secretary. Yes, I will. We have uh, Mark Doxer here from the FinCom, and we have uh, Frank Byron and Karen Snow. And um, with that, we will... John Stempek is not in attendance at this meeting, and Bob Soley, uh, of course, has resigned, and is, we thank him again for his service, and is not here tonight. Um, so we're going to start with the presentation of the fiscal year 2014 audit from Melanson and Heath. Thank you, Mr. Talbot. Um, my name is Karen Snow, and I am the audit manager for Reading Municipal Light Department's fiscal year 2014 audit. And I'm just going to go over the financial statements very briefly, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me and interrupt and ask. I'm just going to start on page one of the financial statements, which is the independent auditor's report. And this is essentially what we are hired to do is give an opinion on whether RMLD's financial statements are fairly stated and materially correct in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And as in years past, this year's audit is an unqualified opinion, so it's a clean opinion. Um, in our opinion, you actually can see the opinion on page two. Your financial statements are materially correct in fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. The management's discussion and analysis, which is in a narrative overview of the financial statements, is on pages three to five, and if you don't really want to look at just numbers, it's a good place for you to just get a quick overview of the results of operations and highlights of what happened in fiscal year 2014. But I'm going to skip right past that and go to page six, which is your statements of net position or your balance sheet, and it is the assets and liabilities and net position of RMLD at June 30th. 2014. This is a comparative statement, so you see two years. You see both this year, 2014, and last year, 2013. And I'm just going to highlight very briefly. Your total assets went up 4%. Um, most of that increase was in your restricted cash and short-term investments, which went up about $1.2 million. Um, the biggest increase was in your depreciation fund, which went up about $1.4 million and your deferred fuel reserve, which went up about one and a half million. And there is more information on that on note three on page 17 of the financial statements. Um, liabilities, you'll notice that there's a fairly large liability for due to the pension trust, and that's offset on page nine, and that's just the fiscal year 2014 contribution from RL, RMLD to its pension trust and the, the money was not paid out before June 30th so it's just a due to and a due from between those two funds. There is what you won't see on here is um, an OPEB liability because in fiscal year 2014 RMLD contributed a little over $300,000 to the OPEB trust, and that is on pages 9 and 10. So they fully funded their contribution for fiscal year 2014, so there is no liability for the OPEB trust on these financial statements. Um, in fiscal year 2015, you will be required to recognize, per GASB 67 and GASB 68, RMLD's portion of the town's 
retirement system, the town's pension, you'll be able, you will be required to recognize your portion of that unfunded liability. And that at June 30th is about $7.8 million. There is um, some supplementary information on page 29 that is a very quick overview of what the unfunded liability is now versus there's four, um, four comparative years there and it also talks about your OPEB, but those are two um, pretty large liabilities. Your unfunded OPEB liability is about six million at June 30th. In fiscal year 2018, that is also going to be recognized on these financial statements. So within the next couple of fiscal years, you're gonna be required to recognize some fairly significant liabilities on the statements of net position. And if there's no questions, I'll just move on to page seven, which is your statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position, which is your income statement for the year. You had a, a minor decrease in your sales. Your kilowatt hour sales were down about 2% for the year. Your operating revenues, your sales were down about 1% for the year. You had some um, temporary over collections for your fuel charge adjustment and your purchase power adjustment. Those just represent temporary fluctuations where you're adjusting those numbers. Some, some years those will be positive, some years those will be negative depending on timing issues of, of when you're collecting that money and what you're charging and what your fuel expenses and your capacity and transmission expenses are. Um, so overall your operating revenues were up about 3% for the year. Your operating expenses remained relatively stable only up about $248,000, so relatively stable on the operating expense side. Your biggest increase in operating expenses was for pensions and benefits, which was up about $658,000. And then your non-operating revenues and expenses, the largest piece of that is your return on investment to the town of Reading, which was $2.3 million in fiscal year 2014. There is an agreement where that is indexed to inflation and the consumer price index, so that's up about 2% from the prior year. Overall, your change in net position was a positive $3.5 million, which is about 6% return. You are um, capped at 8%, so you're right there in the middle and you had an, a nice, healthy net income for the year. Any questions? on that financial statement. The only other statements I just wanna go over very briefly are on pages nine and 10. These are your fiduciary funds, which is your pension trust and your OPEB trust. And Reading contributed the amount that was actuarially determined that they needed to contribute for fiscal 2014 was contributed to both of these funds. It was a little over 1.3 million to the pension trust and just over 300, 343,000 to the OPEB trust. And then you also paid out of your pension trust 1.3 million to the town of Reading for your fiscal year 2014 retirement assessment. Mr. Chair, George, and, oh, and I, by the way, I apologize, George, for not acknowledging you at the beginning of the meeting, uh, George Hooper, CAB member. So <laughs> with that apology, please. Thank you. Just for the people watching at home, we say OPEB, they might not understand what oh, you're I'm saying. I'm sorry, so other post-employment benefits, which is health insurance primarily. It has nothing to do with a pension. It's other post-employment benefits. So this is where you provide a portion of the health insurance benefits, RMLD pays a portion of the cost for its retirees, and this recognizes the obligation you have to not only your current retirees, but your future retirees as well. Thank you. You're welcome. That about covers the financial statements, a very quick overview, like I said. Um, does anyone have any questions? They 
they're not acknowledged in the liability. They're actually expensed in the year that you pay them. They're called pay as you go. Right. So the liability is, I guess, in essence, recognizing the liability you have for the people who are retired now and what you're going to have to pay them over the next however many years, right. plus the people who are working for you now and are eventually going to retire and receive those benefits. Is there anything for the subcommittee? Yes. And we'll have a report of the subcommittee. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the RMLD subcommittee met before this meeting, along with the Town of Reading subcommittee. It was a joint meeting between the two the two boards, the two uh, groups. Uh, it was the recommendation of the uh, both the audit subcommittee of the board and the Town of Reading audit committee that the board accept the that the commission accept the audit as presented. I see Mr. Herrick is here. I, I, I know he was not able to get to the meeting, I guess, at 6.30, so. Sorry, Mr. Herrick. Yeah, so. <laughs> I don't know if you have any specific questions or anything, that, you know, so. But it was the uh, unanimous vote of uh, both both groups to recommend to this board that we accept the audit. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will make a motion that the uh, RMLD Board of Commission accept the uh, Town of Reading uh, Municipal, Reading Municipal Light Department Annual audit, uh, annual financial statements, which are audited, and that we accept them. Second. Second. Yep. All in favor? And the motion carries three to zero. Just one item. Um, it was mentioned that uh, I did ask if there was a management letter that we are detailing any any particular control issues, and I was told that we there will be no uh, management letter issued. Okay. That there's no material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies. Thank you. Um, and I just would like to add to this that, um, you know, town meeting met uh, Monday night and voted uh, 65, uh, 68 to 45 to ask FinCom to uh, help us look at our procurement issues. And, um, and, and we want to welcome Mark Doxer, the chairman of the FinCom here. I don't want to put you on the spark, spot, Mark, but if you would like to, if there's anything we could just say here at the meeting about what you'd like to try to accomplish or we could take it offline and or do it at the, at the next meeting. Do you want to just so the public can hear? Um, Come to the microphone. Yeah, why don't you guys yeah, get home now? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah, no. Thanks for coming. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. You're welcome to stay, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not, um, not really specific comments, just that um, FinCom has created a subcommittee um, which will look into what's the best way uh, to, to approach looking at the town boards, the RMLD, and the schools. Um, and procurement is, is obviously the focus area at this point. Um, we'll be meeting next week, and then uh, hopefully we can start to have some discussions from there in terms of what information uh, we'd like okay. to have. Very much appreciate your offer of information that's already been um, yeah. Provided or, or continue. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, I mean, on the specific matter of these surplus trucks that we've been over a number of times, I know that that's already been pulled together, and be happy to make sure that gets to you. Um, there's quite a lot of it: photographs and maintenance records and oil changes and so forth. So that's all out there to, to give if, if that needs to be re re revisited. But uh, otherwise, I guess um, I don't know, Colleen, you have any questions on just a process? Uh, do we need to discuss that? Be mindful that you know we're trying to, you know, you know the operation as Business well. Research. So we want to yep. be able to uh, accommodate your requests of all the documents, and I'm just looking forward to knowing what the process is so that we can start to help you. Absolutely, no, and I appreciate and the support, and, and our plan is to again. The reason I'm not saying much tonight is I'd rather have us sure. very focused on how we'll approach it, and then we can share that information. And I uh, go ahead, Tommy. Yeah, so I guess I just echo a little bit. So I think. Uh, as a board, we certainly su support and uh, want to endorse uh, the, uh, the work. And I would just say my main concern would be after fresh off the audit is wanting to maintain the, uh, the profitability of the uh, RMLD for the, the benefit of our rate payers, but also the town of Reading, which is a concern to us. So <laughs> the speed and timeliness, et cetera, of audits uh, in, in my own business reminds me of the need to 
make sure it's not uh, so invasive as to have a negative impact on productivity. I mean, it's just the nature of uh, audit. So I would, uh, I'm sure that would be Colleen's concern, but I, I would just say, you know, add that sensitivity that, uh, you know, the, the goal is to continue to operate profitably and that both can be accomplished. But if something has to be done, you know, in 24 hours, that's a, a different aspect and can spread over some regional periods. So yeah, no, well understood. Um, town meeting asked that we report back to them at November town meeting. Um, what we anticipate is that that will be a progress report of some sort, uh, certainly not a, a completion of, of all our activities. But um, that said, you know, let us put together our plan, and then we'll, sure. we'll come back, absolutely. And um, uh, l let me just say that I, it's hard, I don't qu quite know how to address it, but it just seemed like there was ill feeling in the room at town meeting, and I just I regret that. And it, it does seem unnecessary. A couple of speakers noted that uh, you know, when, when, when we can all work together, it's, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, you know, to the extent I'm responsible for that, I, I regret um, anything I, I've said that would add to that. Um, and I think also this board needs to look again at the vote we took last month with regard to, you know, charging somebody for, for the costs. And I think what, we, what I'd like to do is look at that, uh, that matter that we took up. Uh, and if there are costs, you know, we, you know I'd like to look at the, the legal uh, Im impact of what we did and uh, basically go forward in the spirit of cooperation and perhaps re revisit that vote at our next meeting after examining it a little bit more. Um, and I think that on balance that the expertise of FinCom is welcome and whatever time it takes I would imagine it's going to be worth it uh, and it will be there'll be a positive result. Um, so thank you for being here and um, Phil, please, please, yeah. Since I made that vote, and yeah. discussed that at some time. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I would hope is, and the biggest thing that, that I took objection with is the fact there wasn't communication beforehand right. with this commission. I would hope, that, you know, there's several members that got up, uh, particularly Mr. Berman, who got up and spoke and said, "Gee, I hope we all get together and have a discussion." And I hope, I hope we follow up. We all follow up that. I hope. I think Mr. Berman's, you know, suggestion of former finance committee chairman was an excellent one and we all kind of sit together and, and, and you know talking to have each other you know and you know and, and the other thing is I, I would hope that the instructions were to finance committee I, I hope you don't get influenced by other outside forces it's a finance committee right. project that that I got that very clear from town meeting it was a finance committee absolutely and, and, and we report to town meeting you know just I hope we don't try to influence you from this commission <laughs> No, we, or we, any other outside force. Yeah. <laughs> we report to town meeting, and, and town meeting has, has asked for us to do this. The charter outlines um, that there are some some expectations on, on FinCom to do things for town meeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, your, your point is taken, and town meeting is, is the body that, that receives it. And I think the way the article went through, um, you know, clearly the board will, will be involved in the activities. Right. And, and the you know even though it said investigation, I got the very clear message from town meeting that it's a procurement process that what they wanted to look at and not go beyond that. Well, I think our focus is on the procurement process, and and our hope is that pulling everything together, we you know, we identify what issues there are, if any, and and deal with those. And, and you know, at the end of the day, where where things lead us is where we need to follow. And again, two town meeting, four town meeting. I just have one, one last suggestion. As a former finance committee chairman in the dark ages, <laughs> um, I always made it a point any time that any, anything was discussed that affected a committee, that that committee received an invitation. Word, word of advice. <laughs> right, I mean, so that, I think that was the prelude to any right. feel ill, Ill was just why wouldn't we be at your meeting when you're voting on the article and why wouldn't either the selectmen come here or invite us there? But it's all water under the bridge now. So, but so, so just a, another comment, Mark. So I think, sort of anticipating with November, and, and, and since uh, a number of us all here are <laughs> in town meeting as well, I, I, I don't have the answer because I'm not quite sure of how it's supposed to work, being relatively new to the board. But I think if we, we could have a part of the process include, and certainly Colleen will be included because she's the uh, general manager, but. If there's a way to make sure there's dialogue with the uh, board of commissioners, so we, when we go into town meeting, 
that we can all reinforce the work as opposed to you know see something for the first time. So it's not about doing anything ahead of time, but it's more just be part of the process so we can be supportive, uh, both the town meeting and beyond. So I guess it speaks to the point that, that you made, uh, Dave and, and Phil, just around you know the collaboration piece. So if you have a status report, if there's things that are outside the purview of communicating with it, at least we kind of know generally what's you know progress what's going on and maybe there's obstacles with getting information and we could be helpful or uh, I think it would just be useful as, as a commissioner I know I feel better knowing <laughs> I'm part of the process as opposed to getting an update real time with uh, as a town meeting I mean yeah I think we, we, as um, as the article was written I think we, we can accommodate we're reporting to town meeting and the appropriate boards yeah. so I think we can we can largely accommodate that and again I anticipate a progress report uh, at November not not a final report. Anything else? No. no. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Doctor, for coming for tonight. We, we appreciate it. Thank you, guys. So we are going to, our next item is forming, forming a general manager review committee. Yes. Yes. Okay. Who are you appointing? Well, <laughs> um, I think we need three people on the review committee. Um, so how about um, there's a senior member and I'd be more than happy to serve okay and so would I and um, I mean John's not here and it's just the four of us but we'll we volunteer him anyway. we, we could I mean uh, you want to have it be Phil I actually it probably should could be John okay it should be John I think John would be an excellent, excellent yeah person. okay just because we're the three well you know. John also led the uh, the search committee too so I, I okay. think that's that would be an appropriate Appropriate okay, so then we need a motion, right, to do this, uh, to form the committee with those three? I'll move that uh, the commission appoint a subcommittee made up of Mr. Talbot, Mr. Casino, and Mr. S uh, Stempeck for the purpose of the general manager review. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? And the motion carries three to zero. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Have we not had a review committee, or how long has it been? Um, well, Colleen's been on the job since July of 2013, and we've not. I'm well aware of that, I yeah. said, said, but I was just, we didn't have one in place at the uh, time. We have not had one in place during this fis current fiscal year. No. Okay. So we now do. Okay, thank you. Um, so, update on the ad hoc charter review committee. Yeah, just quickly, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the board's, the commission's recommendation was uh, presented to the uh, ad hoc committee at LAB week ago Monday um, it basically at this point has been referred to the town uh, to the town council um, at this point so Reading Town the originally this was supposed to be the Ruben Rudman opinion that we had was supposed to be sent over to the town council but apparently had not been and so he attended the meeting that night and so it has been presented and he's going to get back sometime in October as to um, there are some members of the Charter Commission who are arguing that the town charter supersedes Section 164. Um, so town council has been asked to look at that issue and, and make some sort of ruling. Uh, I did ask the department if, if the town, Reading Town Council wishes to, you know, can uh, ask questions of Ruben and Rudman that they would be, a, that, you know, the department would make the Ruben and Rudman available for this. And so that's where it's at at this point. I don't know where this is going to go. Um, there are some supporters, there are some detractors <laughs> on the committee at this point. So I, I don't know whether the changes that are in the charter will take place or not. It's something we'll have to uh, look at going forward. And if changes don't get made, I, I don't know what our next step would be at that point. Any further discussion on that? Just progress report, Mr. Chair. Okay, then let's move on to um, approving the board minutes from the March 27th meeting. Um, I believe I was the secretary and made a few tweaks, and if those were implemented, then I'm fine with them. These were one of our lengthy minutes that hopefully we're trying to get away from. <laughs> from a book. It's a riveting reading, too. Ribbing writing too, I'm sure. Yeah. 
I'll move that the uh, minutes of the March 27, 2014 uh, get accepted as presented. Okay. Uh, question, uh, not having been on the board. You're allowed to vote, apparently, I'm told by Gene. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All in favor? Motion carries, 3-0. This only in a year. Exactly. <laughs> I know. There has, to be, there has to be something wrong in the minutes. Um, okay. General Manager's report. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, the first uh, topic is um, next week is National Public Power Week. It's the week where uh, the nation recognizes the benefits of public power. And I'd like to invite everyone to our open house on Thursday, October 9th, between 2 and 5. It's held in the garage. Uh, and um, it was quite a success last year. You can meet Bolter. There's going to be a number of um, technology displays and construction displays, and we invite everyone, all ages, to come on down. So that's 2 to 5 on October 9th. Great. Uh, in accordance with the – may I go to the next topic? In accordance with the, uh, the revised uh, policy number two on surplus material, I need to report on surplus material. At this time, we are seeking uh, fair market value for the disposal of three surplus vehicles, the three trucks that were um, uh, brought back to RMLD, two Station 1 transformers um, from the old Station 1 next door, and scrap wire, both aluminum and copper. process of seeking fair market values on those <coughs> policy processes. What is the, so what, what will you be doing to, to, maybe we could explain to the public what, what that consists of? Well, in seeking fair market value for um, bucket trucks is, uh, can be quite subjective. Um, we have uh, seeking a number of um, companies that sell the trucks that we could get trade-ins. Um, there are not a lot of private companies that will come out and do it for free. So you have to, in accordance with the policy, offset that price with what the truck might be worth. So we're in the process of doing that now. Uh, the policy calls for a minimum of two, or at least two fair market values. Um, and then we're starting the process from scratch with the new policy, which means it will then um, be put on the website for 30 days. It will go into publications, trade publications. It will be offered to each of the towns at the fair market value. And then most likely because it would be considered moderate value, uh, which is less than, um, which is above $500 but less than $10,000, it will probably go to public auction. And then carried on the public au au auction websites as well. Thank you. Um, if as far as the transformers are concerned, the old station uh, one transformers um, are about uh, 40,000 pounds um, minus 10,000 pounds of oil. Uh, the station is um, uh, retired. Uh, the transformers will most likely uh, be just scrap metal, so we have to get uh, market prices on uh, scrap metal for those uh, transformers. And typically what we would do is have the people who bid on that uh, be responsible for um, taking the oil out of the uh, out of the drums. Um, so we're seeking prices on those, and then your scrap wire. We have scrap wire bins that are both aluminum and copper, uh, and then we would get prices for uh, who is trading at the highest for that day when the bins get full. Thank you. Does that conclude your report? That, I think, brings us to the power supply report. Jane Parento. Good evening. I'm here to report on the July purchase power summary. This is the first item under, on the agenda. RMLD's load for June uh, came in at 61.5 million kilowatt hours, and that's about a 5% decrease when we compare that to June of 2013. Our energy costs for the month came in at $2.5 million, and that's equivalent to uh, a little over $0.04 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the June fuel charge adjustment was set at $0.6.5 cents per kilowatt hour, and RMLD sales totaled 55.2 million kilowatt hours. Uh, prior to the fiscal year adjustment, RMLD overcollected by uh, approximately $1 million, and following the fiscal year end adjustment of um, approximately $800,000, 
the deferred fuel cash reserve balance is currently at $4.1 million. Uh, the fuel charge was reduced in July, August, and October, and the uh, current October fuel charge is set at four and a half cents. Um, the deferred fuel cash reserve is slightly higher than what, what, where it typically is. Um, however, given the upcoming winter period and last year's experience with um, natural gas constraints and the exposure on the fuel market, uh, it's anticipated that that will be going down during the November through uh, February time frame. Um, RMLD purchased 19% of our energy requirement from the ISO spot, mar spot market at an average cost of $44 per megawatt hour. <coughs> on the capacity side, our peak demand for June uh, occurred on June 25th at 4 o'clock and it was 143 megawatts. Uh, this compares to a peak of 162 megawatts uh, a year ago. Uh, our, our monthly requirement uh, for capacity was set at 208 megawatts, and our total capacity dollars for the month of June came in at $1.43 million, and that's equivalent to a little less than $7 per kilowatt month. Table 4 shows both the capacity and energy costs, as well as the amount of energy generated by resource. Our June cost for capacity and energy came in at about 6.5 cents. And for the month of June, 6.43% of our energy was purchased from hydro generation. Um, if we look at Table 5, uh, those list the four hydro projects where RMLD receives uh, renewable energy certificates per the PPA that was signed. As of June 30th, 2014, RMLD has um, a little over, a little less than 9,900 RECs, and the current estimated market value of that is about $433,000. Um, table 6 looks at transmission. RMLD's cost for their, uh, transmission for the month of June came in at about 824000 and that's a 31% increase when we compare that to May's figure. Uh, the final two tables in the report are the energy efficiency tables. Um, uh, for the month of June, RMLD processed four commercial rebates, um, totaling uh, just a little over $17,000. And that brought the fiscal year 14 total to um, $277,000. RMLD calculates the savings of approximately 976 kilowatts of capacity and a little over 2,600 megawatt hours in energy savings. On the residential side, um, we calculate a savings of about 257 kilowatts in capacity and 123 megawatt hours of energy savings. Uh, for the fiscal year uh, ending for June 14th, um, RMLD processed 1,215 <coughs> residential rebates, totaling a little over $77,000. And we also, um, 363 residential customers received audits from the RMLD, um, and that cost us a little over $72,000. That's the report for June. Mr. Chair? Yeah. On the Rex, how mm -hmm. does that number compare to last year's, previous years? Uh, the market's been pretty sta static. Uh, they're coming in around $52. Mm -hmm. um, each class of Rex has a different market. Uh, we the, the projects that we have entitlements in qualify for both um, Connecticut and Rhode Island primarily, and there's some Massachusetts one Rex, uh, but that Rex market has been pretty stable over the last two years. Okay. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, I, have, I just have a question about the rebate programs because there was the study that the um, planning aid, M, what are they called again? The MAP, MAPC, MAPC, yeah, they did something and they had some suggestions. And then we have another study that we're looking at tonight. Are we, are we comfortable with how these are working and the cost benefit of these? Um, we'd love to. Re uh, I'm short staffed in my department. Right. Uh, the, the position that really manages those. Um, we're looking to fill that position, um, so unfortunately we don't have the manpower currently to, right. to really fine tune it, so we're working with what we have with the hopes of um, adding sure. new programs and making modifications. I mean, as I recall, just as a homeowner who's used them in the past, that some of these are tied to certain uh, efficiency of the a AC. Correct. And whether that's become outdated because no no yeah. it's, it's still we we, we we benchmark these against programs that the IOUs have okay and so our standards are high okay um, you know obviously it needs to be tweaked and it's just a matter of um, getting some manpower in to, uh, to enable us to do that okay but so in the meantime we're 
we're mirroring what the like NSTAR does. Correct. So Correct. if they're if they're tweaking what they do, we tweak ours in response. Uh, to that. Not as um, quickly as we could, and again, it's just we need bodies to be able to do that. Well, um, we can outsource that. We're outsourcing currently um, assistance with our commercial audits. Okay. Um, and so it's just a manage of we're managing that. I guess I wonder if it's worth just a, a quick look and then at our next meeting it, 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 to see if these are indeed aligned with what NSTAR is doing. Yep. And, and you know, we, we could take action potentially on something. For, I'm making this up, but let's say there's, we're giving away money for ACs that everybody's buying anyway because uh, they don't make the low seer ones anymore. That, that something like that we could fix potentially if there was something like that that you found. Yep. So. I'd be happy to report back on okay. that. Thank you. Tying into that, yep. um, we've developed uh, an electric charging uh, program. Uh, I think we have just one slide on this. Um, uh, the current application is on uh, the RMLD website. Uh, we have developed a, uh, a rebate of uh, up to 50% of the cost of the charger as well as the cost of installation and that's capped at $1,500 because of the fact that it addresses both residential and commercial. Um, the typical, uh, we've done two of these, two customers in Reading um, own electric vehicles and uh, we, they've filled out the application. We've gone out to visit them. We've, um, we took somebody from engineering and we've um, looked at the charging station and we continue to monitor uh, their usage. Uh, one of the customers, um, as one of the benefits of having a charging station is they charge at night. Uh, so those two customers are <coughs> on the time of use rate. Our, our off peak rate is considerably less than an, our on peak rate. Um, and um, one customer, he uses almost 90% of his power off peak uh, with, the, with the addition of, um, he's on the electric water heater as well as having the electric vehicle. So it's, there's some very advantageous um, programs here uh, for this. What um, is so, the, uh, so what does a charger cost typically? Uh, the, uh, the, the, two co the two that we've rebated, they're in the five to seven hundred dollar range, and then the installation usually you have to pull a permit and get an electrician to come. That could be you know a couple of hundred dollars. So the two the, the two prices that we've received have been in the six to eight hundred dollar range um, for the completely installed charger, and the RMLD re rebated fifty percent of that. Um, so it has to be a level two charging station. Uh, what that means is that it's at 240 volts. Um, this, is, this program is for both residential and commercials for plug-in vehicles. Um, as I mentioned, uh, typically the, the commercial ones are much more expensive than the residential ones. Uh, we're working with a, a customer um, in, in Wilmington um, and each situation could be different. Um, I know some of the 99s have charging stations and they market that as a value added service. So that becomes part of their le electrical service that they have. Uh, there's other applications where if they were in a public place, um, the RMLD would own that charging station. And so we're working with um, a commercial customer where we're actually owning the charging station and they're allowing their employees to charge while they're working. Uh, Tears of Shakespeare, who works in my group, uh, was working with the Mass DEP and she was successful in obtaining um, a $9,800 grant towards the cost of those charging stations. And so um, those are scheduled to be, uh, the, all, the all the agreements have been signed um, and those are, should be in, installed by the end of the year. What would a, uh, for a homeowner vehicle, how long would the charging process take? It usually, uh, it depends on the size of the battery, but typically it, it, it takes anywhere between five and eight hours uh, to get a full charge. Um, and just the way people are going to be using these things, um, it's going to be very different than a gas um, vehicle where, you know, you charge it on the way to work or um, on the way home or while you're shopping. These vehicles, you're really charging them at night and you're just topping them off during the day. Um, so it wouldn't, caught, unless you have a very far distance to travel the, or it's winter time and you're running your heater, which is draining your battery additionally, 
Um, you're typically you're going to be just to topping off your battery, whether you're shopping or at work or. or well, the, the 99 example, you're going to dinner and charging while you're. While you're while you're eating dinner, exactly. Sure. Question. Um, for the, you said public buildings, which is uh, you know uh, some of the key for us. Mm -hmm. I would think in Wilmington, uh, a lot of our public buildings would be interested. So the RMLD would own them. It, we would work with you. It, it's really there's various options. Um, some customers want to own them, mm -hmm. and they want to provide this free. Um, if the the particular application was one where you wanted to um, charge the customer for using it, then most likely RMLD would own it, and then we it would be a pay-as-you-go situation. Whereas customers came up, they would swipe, and they'd have to. Because I'm it. thinking along the lines of schools. Mm -hmm. You know, you have especially with our new high school being yep. built. Uh, we'd want to promote that. Yep. Uh, some of our other facilities, town hall, uh, public safety. You sure, know, we'd love to meet with you uh, and your group to decide you know, what the appropriate application is. Um, the, the, the grant at the DEP, it's a first come, first serve, so I'm not sure how much monies are left over, mm -hmm. um, but we'd be happy to work with any of our customers um, um, in that regard. I'm sure, because we could help install some yep. of the, my departments. Correct. So. Okay. How about here at the RMLD campus? Having a couple of us chargers out, run your credit card, sell some electricity. It's probably part of the master plan that's kind of been, you know, again, there's all different applications and um, it's something that we're very excited about and we're looking to work with customers. So yeah, so this is the future, I think. I'm really gonna see, uh, we got Tesla building a $5 billion battery factory in Nevada. It's gonna be the biggest battery factory in the world. They're gonna come out with a mass market car they just have been approved in Massachusetts to sell. So exactly, and they were, right. And so then the the, the Model S is like a seventy thousand dollar car, the one they sell now. But the next one's going to be kind of, you know, you you or I could afford it, or at least I could afford it. But along with Tom, what Tom was asking, I mean, in comparison on the car, the Tesla compared to a Nissan Leaf, charging time. I mean, there's a big difference. Is there? So, oh yeah, it's huge. Plus, it's based Tesla. on the battery size, and the right. Tesla has a very large battery. Right. Um, yeah, the Leafs are eighty about an eighty mile range, and yeah, as Jane said, about a five to eight. Like two ten, I think. Is that? So, yeah. Is it? Huh. So, well, that's very exciting. Thank you very much. Was that? You're was that? Um, and then I have one other item. It's the wholesale power supply. Okay. And that's the last item on my agenda. Um, staff, I put together a memo, uh, basically to Colleen, and uh, which is included in the board books. Um, RMLD has been utilizing a laddering and layering approach over the last seven years in, ter in terms of looking out for four years and procuring a portion of each of those four years um, in power supply. Um, it's, it's, it's worked very well. It's allowed us to take advantage of some significantly low costs. Um, and it's one of those things where you're never going to hit the market perfectly, but you're picking up a piece in order to stabilize your prices. Um, so if I wanted to just step you through this contract timeline to just give you a, a sense of um, how this is accomplished. Um, if you look at um, the, the different colored uh, 8 and a half by 14 sheet here, uh, the lines labeled 1 um, is the on-peak and off-peak uh, kilowatts for each month that have been procured in previous RFPs. And so what that means is <coughs> over the last three years, um, in 2011, 12, and 13, we picked up a portion of, those, of, of each of those amounts for each month going out the, those four years. Um, there was nothing procured in 2018 because every year we're adding a new year. Um, the next lines two is the RFP on peak KW. So the lines in green is the maximum amount of uh, quantities that RMLD will be looking to purchase um, in this upcoming uh, RFP, uh, wholesale RFP, excuse me. Uh, line three is uh, what we'd be looking at in the future, and that's assuming our portfolio changes. If we were to invest in any type of renewable generation or fossil fuel generation, that would be incorporated in that line. Um, and the, the last two lines are four, which is our total requirement. Uh, that's based on our current portfolio, uh, and that also assumes that we have a portion of our power supply on the spot market. Um, uh, 
using that, we're able to take advantage of some low prices, uh, particularly during the off-peak periods, um, and that has been beneficial to our overall wholesale power supply costs. Um, this was presented to the, uh, the Citizens Advisory Board um, at their meeting on August 13th. Um, two of their members were absent, uh, but based on the presentation, it was unanimously voted three uh, to nothing for us to move forward with this procurement. Uh, the total, the maximum amount of energy over the four-year period would be approximately 463 um, thousand megawatt hours. Um, as of August 13th, when this memo was drafted, uh, the average cost was approximately $56 per megawatt hour, uh, and that equated to around $26 million. Any um, questions or? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yep. Question: sure. Can I talk to you about uh, photovoltaic panels, mm -hmm. for solar power for the for the town? For Correct. Your We're looking to, uh, especially on some of our schools, we have uh, the square footage, uh, the open area. I think that would be perfect facing the southerly sky. Yep. Uh, I know that the RMLD would be interested in some generation. So I think uh, the town has a, a perfect location. Okay. On some of our school buildings, just because we have the acreage. Yep. Yeah put it up on there we've just done some new roofs out there so it's kind of a great application. structural would be yes sound. structural is sound so yeah we'd like to I'd love to sit down and meet with you and members of the yeah. town and we can go over I know a lot of the uh, board of selectmen uh, have, have shown some interest in this and this is something that we've been working towards uh, I mean we have capital projects in place so with you guys creating a generation yep. uh, we have the application so that is uh, music to everybody's ears I think thank you very much for should bring that up. Um, what is the town of Reading or the town of Reading school system doing via vis-a-vis -vis PV? Anything? Or the, uh, I know. I, I know. At one point, uh, they were working with the MAPC mm -hmm. um, in terms of they had gone out for a um, state bid, um, and the the vendor that they had originally awarded that to. Um, defaulted and so they had to start the process over and uh, myself and um, Jesse Wilson from the town attended a few of those meetings um, and I could touch base with Jesse to see where they're at but. But, but, but what was the project going to be well they were looking at various uh, buildings okay. uh, within the town of Reading to see what would be ap applicable okay um, you know so it has to be structurally sound in right. order to support the it has to be southerly facing right um, and I think um, it's been a while since I, I don't want to speak, you know, I'm not sure. Was this town or town and schools or schools? This was the town and schools. It was both. Correct. So the person you were dealing with was representing both sides? There were, there were, yeah, we met with uh, Jesse Wilson from the planning department. Uh, Mary DeLive was at the school okay. committee at but that she's point. she's not with the town anymore? No. Uh, so it was our town now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's great. Uh, she's really good. You know, she did the whole efficiency push. Um, so, you, so that as far as you know, there's no action now uh, on the town side to get any of these projects going. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I really can't speak to that. I mean, and uh, George, you should take a look at the Lincoln Sudbury. Um, and if you shoot me an email, I'll send it to you. They're that doing was one of the things actually uh, when you mentioned that yeah. we were looking at it for our new high school. Uh -huh. um, it didn't really work into our plan. I okay. guess Okay. This time, but, but it doesn't have to because the, like they have a existing high school. They got a big parking lot. Right. The they canopy. Just, did, just canopies. I mean. Exactly. And big savings. Looking at uh, especially our older schools that don't have the mechanical, uh, the air handlers and units on top of the roof. That's why I said the acreage up on top of some of our older right. schools is perfect. But you're looking at roofs and not parking lots. Uh, well, parking lots could be something we could address right. also. But uh, like I said, with these buildings right now or currently, I mean, uh, up on these roofs, we have that open open space right yeah and the carports it's tend to be about 30 percent more expensive oh, I didn't than know that. roofs I didn't know um, that. so usually the roofs the first place to again look not at. having the uh, the equipment up on the roofs having the acreage right there knowing the roofs are in f uh, great shape fairly new right yeah it's, that's great it's prime for us, are you gonna so. say you'll save a lot of money and um, so that's great um, anything else I think there's a motion oh sorry 
Um, ready, Mr. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, please, go ahead. Move that the RMLD Board of Commissioners authorize the general manager to execute one or more power supply agreements in accordance with RMLD's wholesale power supply plan for power supply purchase <coughs> for a period not to exceed 15, 2015 through 2018 in amounts not to exceed 29 megawatts in 2015, 27 megawatts in 2016, 24 megawatts in 2017, and 23 megawatts in 2018, represented by the Director of Integrated Resources and on the recommendation of the Citizens Advisory Board and the General Manager. Do we have a second? Yes, and all in favor? Motion carries three uh, to zero. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Hamid Jafari has his energy in engineering and operations report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, right, I'm going to be reporting up for the month of June. The first page on tap B is a financial. Uh, you see on project uh, number 311, 18, 19, and 23 with asterisks right next to them. These are the ones that they completed. Uh, the total budget, the annual budget, uh, was uh, 6 million. Uh, 3.9 million approximately, you know, year to date we spent. And the remaining balance would be 2.2 million. <coughs> the next page, the capital improvements. We got projects 101, 106, and 107 completed, and well, it, they're in process of in progress, the construction. Uh, projects 101 is 5W9 reconductoring ballot veil area, which is 50% completed. Uh, there are some number of URDs in the all towns that they are completed uh, to date, and they worth uh, $5,613. Those are Heritage Way in North Reading, uh, Wildwood Street in North Reading, and Summit Ave in Reading. Uh, projects 107, step down areas, upgrade in, uh, in Reading uh, area, the Bond Street and Vine Street and Hunt Street. These are all uh, completed. And the, the next uh, item, the new customer services connections. We've had a number of service installations in commercial and residential areas. If you go back to page one, you see them and the, the item 12 and 13. Uh, which we've spent $10,047 on residential customers in new installations and $233 for the commercial. <coughs> the next page and the routine construction, the capital improvements. Year to the on month of June, we've spent $74,528 and year to date fiscal is $1,681,729. Uh, the highlights of those are for pole settings and transfers, uh, overhead uh, and underground installations. We've had a number of uh, projects completed uh, in all towns, in North Reading High School, Middle School, driveway uh, widening, Haverhill Street, North Reading, pole relocation, West Street, uh, we did two services, St. Agnes Parish in Woburn Street, and uh, Reading and Avalon Oak West in uh, Wilmington. Uh, we've had uh, four damaged poles that they were repaired in all uh, communities. Uh, we have uh, we've had uh, porcelain cutout replacement uh, that we've done about, uh, we spent $2,009 on those. Uh, lightning, uh, the storm trouble, underground subdivisions we've had in uh, Wilmington and North Reading. My grain road subdivision was completed as a new construction, uh, in new underground subdivision. Amherst Road in Wilmington, the three new lots. Uh, Duane Drive in uh, North Reading was completed also. And we installed some animal guard. Uh, and then the next uh, item, the preventative maintenance program. We've uh, completed a number of projects. Age the uh, overloaded transformer replacement and the those we've replaced four transformers, two uh, single phase uh, pad mount transformers and two three phase pad mount transformers. <coughs> uh, under the single phase pad mount transformers, 
that we've replaced in Wildwood Street North Reading and Heritage Way North Reading and the three-phase transformers they were replaced in Ballard Vale Avenue and West uh, Research Drive in Wilmington. And the poll testing program system-wide, uh, we have uh, identified 640 polls, 640 to 670 polls approximately that they're gonna be tested. The contract was awarded to Empower Technologies. They're gonna get started in mid-October. And uh, that's per uh, USDA mandate that 10% of the poll, own poll in all uh, communities, they're gonna have to be tested. And so we're gonna do that, start doing that uh, uh, in mid-October and hopefully within two, three weeks, we're gonna get a report that uh, is about the status of the, those polls. And uh, it's very interesting uh, program and technology. Uh, the manhole, uh, the 13.8 kV, 35 kV feeders, coral inspections, We've had number of those completed, uh, 3W8, 3W18, 5W4, 5W8, and 5W9 uh, feeders. The manhole inspection programs, it's in pain, pending. We still are developing that program to inspect all the manholes in all four communities uh, for the integrity check and making sure that the cables and all the assets uh, located underground are uh, in, in sound uh, condition. Uh, the porcelain cutout replacements, we've done 10 of those, uh, which uh, basically three were changed out as part of the porcelain cutout replacement program, and additional seven replaced because of the damage. So to date, we've completed approximately 87% of those. Uh, uh, and the next uh, item for preventative maintenance and substations, we have started the infrared scanning, the monthly scanning. Uh, for station three, station four, and station five for the month of uh, June, all the way actually, it's not completed till August. We haven't found any hot spot, any particular problems. Uh, although under the substation maintenance program, the testing of the equipment, as Colleen mentioned er earlier, they've got the three years, there's a cyclic maintenance program, uh, and we've identified some uh, equipment that we are taking care of that they, they need maintenance and they need replacement and we are taking care of that. 80% of that project to date is completed. We expect the UPG to be done by November, hopefully, and uh, that would uh, uh, conclude that uh, mission. Uh, and uh, the system reliability, basically the two indices that we are monitoring uh, for the health of the system, evaluating the health of the system, the duration and frequency of the RGs, they're all under the regional and national average, so our reliability is good. The system average interruption duration for the past five years have been really good, as you could see on page three. Uh, for the month of June, we had 8.82 minutes for the system average interruption duration, which is well below 62.35 for the regional average and 85.75 for national average. Uh, for the system average uh, interruption frequency index uh, for the same period, you see that it's 0.22, which is again below the uh, regional average of uh, 0.55 and national average of 0.83. For customer average interruption duration, you see uh, that uh, we've got 39.77 minutes, which is again well below the national and average of 83 and regional average of 105.77. The next page, you see the list of the uh, cause of the outages and types of outages. For 2014, year to date, uh, June 30th, 2014. Uh, as you could see, the majority of the outage caused were equipment damage and also the trees and wildlife. And we've identified those equipment that they need to be upgraded. Pa most of these equipments are the porcelain cutouts that we have identified. We know that, you know, well, they're causing the problematic and uh, they're identified and they're being replaced as an ongoing uh, program. And for the trees, we have developed a uh, very good uh, tree trimming program. It's a three to five year cyclic program. Uh, the tree trimming 
uh, mm, e we met with all the communities, the uh, DPW directors and town wardens, as well as uh, some town managers and administrators. They've been notified the, with the new tree trimming program, and we're going to be sending notifications to the town administrators and managers uh, with a package regarding the tree trimming program that we have developed to address these uh, outages that they're caused by uh, trees and tree hazardous trees. That concludes my report for the month of June. Any questions from the board? Can I go to the next item? Uh, I'm sorry. Please I'm sorry. do. You had questions? I don't, no. I'm good? No, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess I have one item that needs to be voted for the bid that was, uh, should I go continue calling? Okay. okay. So uh, on July 9th, 2014, a bid invitation was placed as a legal notice in the Middlesex East section of the, the Daily Times Chronicle and the Central Register requesting proposals for <coughs> the Linfield URD excavation project uh, for FY 2015 for Reading Municipal Light. As in, in the invitation to bid was emailed to uh, about 34 uh, construction companies. Uh, bids were received from uh, Tim Zanelli, Excavating LLC, uh, Vantresca, Matuccio, and ERA Equipment. A no bid was received by email from Vitiglio Constructions. The bids were publicly op opened and read <coughs> aloud at 11 a.m. on August 6, 2004. In the town of Reading Municipal Light Department boardroom, located at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Massachusetts. And uh, the bids were reviewed, analyzed, and evaluated by the interim general ma ma manager uh, uh, and uh, uh, the staff. Uh, so I respect respectfully m make a request uh, to. Uh, to make the move uh, uh, that the bid 2015-1 for the Linfield URD excavation project 2015 <coughs> be awarded to Tim Zanelli excavation for 217,300. Uh, so I think that, that day Colleen wasn't here, I guess uh, Jane was. <coughs> Is that, uh, Jane, you were here for the open bid opening? That was the mistake. That was it. That was. I make a correction. I apologize. That should be the general manager and the staff, not the interim. There was no interim. I thought you were covering for Colleen <laughs> that day. Okay, so that's a mistake. I apologize. So I respectfully make a request to vote on this, so we can proceed with it. Motion. Yeah. Move that bid 2015-1 for Linfield. URD excavation project two, uh, 2015 be awarded to Zim Tim Ginelli, hopefully I pronounced that right, excavation LLC for $217,300 as the lowest qualified bid in the recommendation of the general manager. Second. Okay. Question, um, why was the other bids so much higher? Because they look like almost double in many of those other bids that we've got. They all received the same uh, specifications. So it could be, I guess, the timing. Some contractors, you know, they got so much jobs that they just put a high bid out there. They put a high bid out there just to, to throw the. We bid, a, me, we bid on some. Sometimes it's uh, some people own their equipment, others may not, you know, right. so that okay. uh, reflects a lot of that also. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I guess we're ready for the vote. Um, all in favor? Okay. Motion carries 3 0. Oh. Uh, this this actually makes me uh, reminds me of uh, something that I wanted to ask. Um, when we do excavation, do we coordinate with uh, the respective towns? Um, say while we have the street up, that happens. And also when we do that, do we do we put con like conduit in in key places for future stringing of say fiber or anything? Uh, just adding a conduit doesn't really add any cost. But if you ever needed to th throw um, fiber through there or something else you could you could pull it I mean that would be a question for me do, do you know DPW notify for a street opening so we can coordinate any type of underground yes they do yeah, they send me an email they send me and uh, chief engineer email 
And is it is it standard practice to just put some con you know a four inch conduit down there for future pulling wire, pulling fiber, should it be needed? Not really. Depending on which area you know the, sure. the, uh, it is. If it's underground area, we make we try to make it. And if it's not, you know, uh, yeah. then I mean, certainly if it's on a cul-de-sac, you wouldn't do it. But I mean, if it's on a busy street and you're in there, um, I mean, it's it's. I'm told it's good practice to put the empty conduit in there just in case it's needed. It doesn't really add anything to the cost. It's very costly if you want to get to do, do, do that. We're waiting for the organizational and reliability staff yep. to tell us exactly where we need to extend the feeders. Right. So as part of that plan, if, you know, moving sure. forward, if that's within the plan and it's Got calling it. for it, we can, you know, do that. Right. Otherwise, the cost of the construction is going to go up. But, I mean... Sure. I mean, it, it, common sense can apply as but well. Yeah. If you if you happen to be opening up Main Street, uh, right. Route 28 from Calarusos to the right. to the school system, right. you know, you, you'd add. It would make sense to add a piece of conduit for future right. stringing of fiber or wire if right. you had a chance. Just throwing it out there. It's said to be good practice um, for future needs. So, sure. Um, we're appropriate. Well, thank you. Is that is that all? That's all. I don't have anything else except, uh, Colleen, you want to go to organizational study? <coughs> uh, on Monday, April 14th, uh, 2014, an RFP request for proposal notice was published in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Good Food Services Bulletin. And on Wednesday, April 16th, the request for proposal was published as a legal notice in the Daily Times Chronicle, Middlesex East Section, to conduct two comprehensive in integrated studies for the Reading Municipal Light Department, <coughs> organizational study and electrical reliability study. Uh, the RFPs were sent to 16 firms as well. Um, the, there was a, the RFP review committee consisted of myself and Hamid Jafari, the Director of Engineering and Operations. The committee performed a formal RFP review of qualifications of all four proposals received, which was from ESC, Booth and Associates, Loomis, and Lighthouse. Um, the committee reviewed, analyzed, and evaluated the proposals using comparative criteria, developed a composite rating for each of the firms. The firms with the most advantageous proposals based on the ratings and pricing were Lighthouse to perform the organizational study and Booth and Associates to perform the electrical system study. Hamid's going to go over right now quickly uh, the, the points of scope for uh, the organizational study and the reliability study. Yeah, and the uh, organizational study highlights the basically uh, assessing the current uh, organizational, physical, and operational structure, and then uh, they're going to perform a gap analysis in order to make recommendations for the organization of oversize and where the future of the industry lies and uh, what the requirements are. Uh, we, they're going to do the evaluate the engineering operations and safety practices and uh, going to identify deficiencies that we might have in those areas. They're going to evaluate energy efficiency programs and making recommendations for demand side management, distribution generations, and where we can, you know, bring more savings for uh, RMLD. Uh, they're going to provide an efficient business model to be best uh, utilize uh, the RMLDs to best utilize RMLDs fiber loop and that's another area that uh, I know Mr. Tarot is has high interest on <laughs> it's uh, 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 develop strategies for risk uh, management and major emergency plan of operations and also uh, career development and succession planning uh, to make sure we meet the future requirements and our uh, staff, they have the skills necessary in order to uh, reach that, to get that. So that would be for the organizational study. The next uh, slide, please. The highlighted reliab reliability study is that we, uh, we would like to develop a short range and long range system planning, evaluating substation capacity, feeder capacity, and minimizing the losses. Uh, we also would like to provide energy efficiency DSM, the DEN and peak shaving programs recommendation in order to uh, um, uh, do more savings for the rate payers. Uh, provide a roadmap to improve and sustain reliability. 
provide assess management recommendations, asset management rec recommendations, and this the and also perform comprehensive system protection coordination evaluation. This is very important for uh, the reliability mm, to make sure all the protective devices on the feeders they trip out in the sequence in case there is a fault. And uh, we're going to develop a smart grid roadmap. Uh, as of now, we have partially developed the, ma the roadmap. However, we need to make sure, depending on the outcome of the study, that kind of finalize which direction we need to go and how many remote switches we're going to have that is going to be operated from the SCADA and how it's going to tie into with the technology that we're going to uh, employ uh, to meet the future goals and also minimize the duration and the frequency of the outages so to improve the reliability in other words. Uh, we're also going to perform the GIS gap analysis and make recommendations. As you are aware, our GIS data hasn't been maintained for quite a few years. We need to bring that model up to date. Once the model is updated, that's going to be pushed out into engineering model MILSOF for analysis and also uh, for engineering analysis and more making future recommendations for the construction as far as addressing the capacity for the feeder and the substation concern. And also that's also going to be pushed out to outage management system for uh, uh, be to be able to identify the outages and restore the outages in another package called fault detection isolation restoration, which is are all uh, under the umbrella of the distribution management system package that's operated from the real-time system SCADA. And the SCADA, in other words, is going to be managing all, all the distribution feeders, uh, activities and monitor outages and making decisions in the future how to route, reroute the circuit in order to minimize the losses and also restoring uh, the outages in the expeditious manner. So all of these good plans are coming uh, hopefully after we do the gap analysis, we know where the future lies and uh, which direction we should be making the investments, basically. Okay. So based on the evaluation process <coughs> in accordance with the memorandum from myself to the RMLD Board of Commissioners dated September 15th on 2014, um, and based on the evaluation process, it's in the best interest of RMLD to award the organization organizational study to Lidos and the system reliability study to Booth and Associates. Both firms are considered qualified in developing comprehensive and organizational reliability studies. However, Booth and Associates presented a more structured format with a better understanding and ability to execute reliability scope at the level commensurate with RMLD's intent. I have a question. Sure. Um, so there's some estimates out there that they, there'll be something 20 to 30 percent PV on grids in the next 30 to 40 years. Right. And it's going to happen whether we want it to or I mean, we want it to happen. So will this give us a grid that can support 20 to 30 percent PV? I mean, is, is that something that these organizations are looking at, that that's the future and uh, that we'll have the engineering and the organization necessary to both be in that business? That definitely is going to provide a roadmap, yes. The, as far as the system capacity-wise concerning, yes, we do have. Even now we could ha add those, so uh, it, it won't be a problem. Okay. What this uh, study is going to provide us, basically, where we should make the investments as far as the uh, capacity concerns, what the substation capacity should be. We know we need uh, probably a new substation where the load is concentrated in Wilmington area. And in, uh, we know the areas that you've identified, the areas that the load centers are in uh, other communities as well, too. So this study basically is going to give us the roadmap where we should make the most investment and where we need to beef up the capacity for future need. All the, the, the new uh, energy, uh, I mean the energy resources, the, the, the renewable, uh, renewable energy resources is going to do Basically, it's going to help to support that structure. So that's from an en engineering point of view. Yes. But what and what about from a business point of view? That 
RMLD could be in the actual business of, say, putting up a photovoltaic generation station in Wilmington, for example? Like, will that help us define how we would go into that business? Actually, we had a meeting this morning with uh, Tangent, and that was discussed. Yeah, there are opportunities that, you know, at the substations we could install, distribute this generation. Right. We are reviewing and we are studying those options, the vo viability of those options, and how practical it would be. Also, in some instances, it makes sense, you know, if we, uh, uh, you know, if we co cooperate with the uh, customers. So the right, uh, so they can install distributed generation on their property. And you know, they could- That we would own or that they would own? That they, if that is uh, both ways. It yeah. has pros and cons uh, for each. Uh -huh. That's something that needs to be studied. I guess Jane can elaborate more on, on that. Uh, do you want to add anything, Jane? No, it's we're, we're, we're looking at those. It, it becomes part of the strategic plan of the organization. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and that piece of it. So I believe the strategic plan along with the organizational study and the reliability study all folded together. Right, right. Because you guys know what's coming. I mean, right. the, the very sharp technology adoption, I think, is on the way both with cars, electric cars, and with PV, at least from what I'm reading. It's not something I'm making up. It's right. costs are going way down, and these are going to be big. You know, well, we the, st the study will look at the projected load growths, but they'll also look at the impact of, the, of PV. Right. They'll look at the business opportunity of which ones will be have, you know, partnerships in, um, and look at the capacity that's already existing versus what we might need or areas where we might not need to improve because the PV will offset it. Right. I mean, they're supposed to look at all of those things that's as good. you go into 20 years, um, but there'll be projections as well that'll that'll give you um you know the best uh, indication of um where where we need to focus our capital improvements over 20 years mm -hmm. that's great I, I just have a question for you Mr. McLean. so uh the bids that we have are they because I, I definitely support both of those studies but just curious uh were the were these bids mid-range because we, we talked about in the previous uh so were these, how, how do these bids compare to the rest of it? So the mid-range or? Actually, they, um, it's attached in your last tab. Um, excuse me, tab E. Um, and, and I guess the other question, more just process, so these kinds of studies, so if it's, how, how does the out of scope work get managed? So I assume this is a fixed bid, so it's not billable hours that approximate this of the work is, is provided for the amount approved. Right. But if there's other, because there may be other opportunities on succession planning or other things, so is that just handled as a request for additional services if, if we decide to do that? If there's that. transition projects that come out of this, generally what they'll do is they'll lay out um, what the recommendations are uh, in a timeline uh, and prioritize them, and then um, and then make recommendations of what would be the most cost beneficial, yeah. um, and then we would proceed from there with the types of projects that we want to undertake. Um, but there'll be some that are be immediate that won't be costly, like process improvements or you know internal business improvements uh, and then there'll be others uh, that you know be more like capital projects uh, you know we're looking at the skill sets um, and the career development of staff to make sure that we're properly sure. staffed and, and we have the right skill sets uh, for not only now but for the future because um, as you go into the future technology is going to change and you want to make sure that you keep your staff skilled uh, to be commensurate with, with the system that you're operating. The flexibility of the system that we get, will get out of this as well will also demonstrate to speak to our ability to manage our team. Because the more flexible that we can control the system, right. um, the better off we will be. Uh, efficiency wise, meaning the system efficiency and, and the flexibility to be able to almost uh, load profile, um, especially if we, you know, if we have, if we develop uh, other types of rates in the future. 
when do these contractors um, get paid and do we have the ability when we get drafts in to ask them follow-up questions and have them maybe study another go another level on something that we weren't satisfied with the answer they gave us or of course well the, the first thing that's going to happen is a kickoff meeting where they'll, they'll come in and give an actual presentation to the Board of Commissioners and explain what their approach is and what they're going to be looking at what they're going to do in the timeline um, and then they'll come back and they'll do a presentation of their findings and their recommendations um, and um, Certainly, they'll be meeting with staff as well. And but if at any time we don't feel like they've met the level of scope, I mean, I think we'll be identifying that along the way. I mean, um, the way that Hamid and I looked at these evaluations was that you know certain companies will be do do a twenty thousand foot evaluation, and we wanted a little bit more detail so that um, we were really able to capture. Um, you know specifics so that we could for sure yeah. yeah I mean that's what I mean is that that it's possible to write a report that sounds good but doesn't really give you that much meat in there and you want better answers will we as the board have the ability to say look we need another cut at this um, well the level that we're getting here is, is typical of organizational studies and reliability studies that will be able to give us uh, the detail between one and five years, uh, and then 10 years, and then 20 years. Um, uh, and the recommended, uh, recommended changes. Um, without getting into specifics of what detail you might want to go. Um, and what's the moment when they, when it's, we're satisfied with what they've given us and they get paid? When is that moment? Is that tonight? They get paid in advance? They get paid when they deliver? They get paid when they deliver and you're happy with it? I'm just curious how these things they work. they milestones. The milestones that they reach. And what's the last one? Phases. The last one is when they give us a report. And then you they get their the last check report, and they're done. Yeah. They're supposed to give us a presentation. Presentation to the management and the staff as well as the board. I mean, it sure would be nice to get the presentation of their findings, but there's still, we need to be feeling like we got what we paid for. That And there's that last payment doesn't come until we have had that presentation and we feel like we've gotten what we what we paid for. Absolutely. So I'm That's generally how our things yeah. work. I just would I would I would like to have it be working that way. That they come in and they haven't already gotten their final payment before. We've heard what they had to say, we've read their report and we're satisfied. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So yeah. that's generally how that's our things okay. work. Are there any further yeah. questions? They need our recommendation for the next job, so that's how we check right. their, you know, definitely. Okay. Uh, we check their references, and they'd like to have us as a good reference, so I'm sure they're going to do a good job. Are we ready for a vote? Are you ready for the motion? I'm ready for the motion. Okay. Move that the RMLD Board of Commissioners accept uh, Lidos, I guess Bill, I pronounced that right, to perform the organizational study at the cost at its cost of uh, ninety nine thousand dollars, and Booth and Associates to perform the electrical systems reliability study at a cost of one hundred and sixty one thousand oh ninety dollars for the RMLD based on the recommendation of the general manager for a total cost of two hundred sixty thousand oh nine oh. All in favor? A second. Take a second. Oh, Tom sorry. Second. 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 Okay. All in favor. Now. All in favor. The motion carries three to zero. Yeah, that that is very exciting stuff. Um, is there anything else? Uh, any further discussion? No. No. Um, our next meeting is. Okay, so our next meeting is going to be. Did we say the twelfth instead of? Okay, sure. Okay, so our next meeting will be on Wednesday, November 12th at 7.30 p.m. Okay. Are you making a presentation at uh, town meeting? Um, I think so. Are you I, making a presentation, Mr. Chairman? Um, I think Colleen will, and I'm, I might want to say a few words as well, I mean, if they let us. Um. Do we want to present my, my flip chart? Is that you? Your flip chart. The flip chart, uh, the financial structure of the department. Um, we talked about that at one point. You could, um, 
Why don't we could take that? Do we have to t discuss that and decide that now? Yeah. Um, we have until November. Right. <laughs> we should take a look at the. Yeah. Right. We do. Right. Um, I, w I will say, but just on this town meeting thing, I think what's important is that town meeting knows what the RMLD is doing and how transformational many of the things we're working on really are. And that that gets communicated to them because I don't think most people really understand what a utility is, what the challenges are, what these, why these things are important from LEDs to charging stations to smart grid to PV. This stuff is really important and um, it's exciting and I think we, the presentations need to explain these things to them because I don't think they understand. They hear about, you know what they hear about. Um, so whether it's Colleen or me or both of us, that's what the presentations, presentations need to be focusing on so that they understand. So in the flip chart, um, do they not under, I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't think that there's an understanding of, of just how the financial structure of the department is. Okay. I don't really feel that that's, you know, I, you know, town meeting continues to change over. Right. You know, there aren't any old dogs like, like me around anymore. Right. <laughs> there aren't as many old dogs. I There's a few of them on town meeting. Well, I think, you know, my good friend, Mr. Brown, you yeah. know, and I think it'd be a good, maybe a good time to bring that out and actually show the department, you know, how we go from the rates to the bottom line. Okay. I mean, it would be only a, a short presentation. I would make it if that's, if we. I, it's not, I don't think it's up to me, really, to well, um, decide what gets, the it's chair. the moderator. Okay, well, let's chair. think about mm -hmm. it a bit. Yeah. Um, well, when John, we should connect with John. We have a full committee. Yeah. We'll talk about yeah. the agenda. Okay. Right. So, Gene, we need to set a meeting for the general manager. Was that what you were getting at? Yeah, I'll, I'll get close. Do we need to do that now? That's why we're like, no, I can't do that. Right, right. Okay, fine. So. I can't make a meeting until after, April 5th, after uh, October 15th, so. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so I think we need um, a motion to yeah. go into executive session then. Move that the board go into Hold on, Gene. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 okay. Move that the board go into executive session to approve the executive session meeting minutes of March 27, 2014. Uh, section 164, section exempt, that's out. Yeah. Okay. And to discuss uh, mediation and union negotiation update and return to executive session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Second. Second motion. Okay. All in favor? Motion. Mr. Pacino, aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay. Case motion carries. 3-0. Thank you, everybody.